So I was asked to come here to talk about the circumgalactic medium uh, at the summer school that's about the interstellar medium. Um, so uh, what I'd like to focus on in the next uh, couple hours or so is on the physical condition of the gas. Specifically, uh, what I'm going to focus on, I will try to focus on, is about the thermodynamics, ionization, and chemical enrichment of the gas. So, uh, so I understand this is uh, this uh, should come as a detour from uh, what you have been hearing about uh, for the last week or so. So I'm going to spend some time uh, trying to uh, motivate your interest. Uh, if you are wondering, for those who uh, are wondering why at the summer, uh, ISM Summer School uh, you're hearing about the circumgalactic medium, uh, so I'm borrowing the words from the big gun. Uh, I think everybody is very familiar with this textbook, and I don't know how many of you actually noticed that on the title, it's about the intergalactic medium as well. So basically, uh, what I want you to start with is to uh, know that uh, the physics is really uh, very similar. It's just different scale. And so I'm going to borrow heavily from everything you have heard uh, from the last uh, few days. And uh, so moving on, I will also, I plan to give a, a brief overview uh, on line profile analysis or physics. And this is really just to bring everybody on board. I understand there's a wide range of background here. Uh, and after that, I'm going to try to uh, divide the subject into uh, two areas, basically following the techniques that we use, people use to study the, the diffuse gas. One uh, in, in emission, which is really enabled by recent instrument advancement, mainly because of integral field unit. I understand that uh, many radio astronomers here, uh, this is like, you know, this is what you know from day one and since birth. But for optical astronomers, this is brand new uh, revolution uh, to be able to see uh, 3D data cube uh, over a uh, uh, sizable uh, area of the sky is really a game changer. And so this is a fairly new area. Everything you're going to hear about really uh, is extracted from the past few years. And you, you're going to see that uh, um, the results are really in the very infant stage. There are uh, still a lot to be learned. But after that, I'm going to move to uh, absorption spectroscopy that has been going on for decades. So you're, you, you will, um, I hope you will come, it will come across as uh, a more mature field, but uh, a lot have been learned um, based on high resolution spectroscopy. Finally, the main point really is to connect that back. Everything we can study uh, from uh, gas properties uh, to connect that back to galaxy formation and evolution. And uh, again, uh, just before I jump in, I want to give you a few references. Uh, since this is still fairly a uh, new subject, not as well established as the, like the interstellar medium, even though Bruce actually did include intergalactic medium on the title of the book. Um, but so all these uh, references here, you see our review articles on the archive, uh, starting from the most recent one written by Claude Andre, Fauchier Jigar, and uh, Peng O oh, on the physical Two theorists uh, spelled out every single thing you need to know about the diffuse gas. And then followed by uh, uh, also a fairly recent review in physical reports uh, on baryon cycles in the biggest galaxies. I guess you can imagine that is uh, galaxy clusters, but uh, a lot of physics and results are applicable to lower mass halos. And those are by Megan Donahue and uh, Mark Void. Then followed by three uh, topic uh, reviews. Uh, from 2017, one is annual reviews of astronomy and astrophysics physics by Tomlinson, Peebles, and work. Uh, you can see that this is a well-cited um, article on circumgalactic medium in general, but uh, there are also two, uh, myself wrote two uh, review chapters. Uh, at the same year, uh, more focused topics, including the outskirts of galaxies using absorption spectroscopy and uh, another one uh, concerning massive halos. So these are the references I encourage you to check out, and then they are all active links. So just to uh, start to motivate, um, um, again, why are you here to hear about the circumgalactic medium? And uh, so once we, if we want to talk about something that's different, better to define it. So what is the, circum the circumgalactic medium? Anybody, any thoughts? Anything outside of stars? Is there any difference between, what's the difference between interstellar medium and circumgalactic medium? 
So I just want to show a few examples. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this um, extraordinary dwarf galaxy. Uh, this is a composite image with the optical uh, extent in the middle, uh, you know, as the base, uh, overplotted with the H1 uh, signal, 21 centimeter signal on top. So the, the H1 disk is 10 times larger than the optical extent. So is this a galactic medium? What about this one? Extraplanar gas. Um, you can see, again, this is also H1, turn in here image. You can see the condensate goes down to 10 to the 19. Um, this is, um, one way to quantify this is the scale height. It's also about 10 times larger than the optical extent. Is this a galactic medium? What about this? How many people have seen this? High velocity clouds. Is this the circumgalactic medium? Uh, keep going. Now into the really hot plasma around the elliptical galaxy. Is this the circumgalactic medium? So roughly speaking, I, I went to a CGM workshop uh, in Aspen a few years ago. Somebody randomly just casually mentioned, maybe we should define the circumgalactic medium. Didn't expect that that ends up being a one hour discussion. Uh, so we're not going to spend one hour to uh, contemplate what uh, circumgalactic me medium is defined. Uh, I would just say that the way I think about this is everything beyond the stellar disk. If we, if you can draw, I mean, plot um, the surface density of stars compared with surface density of gas, whenever the gas surface density exceeds uh, stars, I consider that uh, the territory here. So now, why do we care about the circumgalactic medium? Going back to uh, you have been hearing for the past uh, few days, you know, about feedback uh, and all the different physical processes that's happening in star forming regions. Later, we're gonna hear about extreme starburst environment. Uh, so this is the, the baryon cycle uh, that I have in mind. I hope to uh, convey to you, starting from the left, you know, depends on where you come from. From the more, you know, global cosmological perspective, Things start from infalling uh, from the IGM, from, uh, feeding star formation in the galaxies. And then as the star evolves, it's going to eject material. We heard that um, uh, exciting talks yesterday, especially. And then in, in, you know, in the end, uh, enrich the intergalactic medium. While all the stars you know, the, do their own business within the galaxy, transform the galaxy in the meantime. So much of what we hear about in this uh, summer school is around the green circle. And this is the two hours, less than two hours now that you're gonna hear about the blue circle here. So why should we care about it aside from you know this part of the evolution process? Uh, for a while we have uh, heard, uh, this is the latest pie chart I can find that uh, everything we see, we can see in galaxies, including stars, and the H1 gas, um, or even plasma. The, anything we can see consists of only uh, no more than 10% uh, of all the baryons we know in the universe. So neglect the pie chart, maybe this is a better uh, graph to show. Uh, this is compo compiled by Fabian Walter uh, just a few years ago. I really like this plot, uh, but you want to see that cosmic age goes to the right. That means high redshift in the back, I mean, to the left. Uh, in the present time, if you add up all the components, starting from cold gas, you know, H1, H2 in orange at the bottom, you know, in the inset, to stars uh, in the maroon color, we really, you know, at the present time, we really only see less than 10% of all the baryons we know from cosmological experiment. So that means uh, there's, uh, 90% of uh, mass out there. And this is the reason I hope uh, to motivate your interest that we need to not only in order to sustain star formation, uh, massive star, low mass star uh, in the galaxies that you care about, that produce all the fascinating images that you're not gonna see in my talk, but uh, fascinating images, um, you need supply. Uh, and that's what uh, this is about. So um, why? Is this uh, an issue? Why is this a topic to discuss? Um, 
So in, we have heard even within the galaxy, you know, star formation, uh, interstellar medium, it's a multi-scale, multi-phase problem. So that direction goes down, you know, from sort of KPC scale down to sub KPC scale, AU scale even. Now we're going back uh, to large scale uh, in the context of circumgalactic medium. So I'm just gonna show just as an illustration purpose. This is a, a snapshot from the illustrious, illustrious collaboration that's based on dark matter uh, only. You can see how the dark matter density uh, is distributed within this 50 megaparsecs volume. And it's high, uh, obviously highly clustered. But within this, all the sophisticated cosmological simulation now can more or less reproduce uh, the fancy galaxy images that you saw in real life. So what would the galaxy, what would the galaxy content look like in this volume from the same simulation? Uh, I don't know if you can see anything there. There is a galaxy cluster, massive cluster in the middle. That's it. This is a stellar light. Uh, but then when we talk about gas content, this is it. So there's in principle, uh, really diffuse gas filling the entire cosmological volume. So how do we how do we capture that? And uh, just to I go the wrong way, but just continue. Uh, so um, clearly the gas is multi-phase and the scale is enormous. So I kind of jump, but you can see that from the center, you know where you see the starlight, you can zoom in. That's equivalent to the local group that we know about. If we keep zooming in on a single galaxy, this is the um, you know the famous NGC 891 with exoplanet gas. Keep going into the high velocity clouds, you know, we're talking about 100 parsec scale. So all of this, remember from the uh, intro slide, this is everything I consider as uh, the circumgalactic medium. And uh, the, the large, the vast dynamic scale is really captured in this uh, temperature and density phase diagram. Just want to emphasize that uh, in the x-axis, you can see density goes from anywhere below 10 to the minus five to you know, 100 particles per uh, cubic centimeters. Everything we, you have heard about, what is the typical density in the ISM? Higher. So uh, what I tell people about my research is I study vacuum. The best vacuum in the laboratory on Earth is <laughs> way out there. Any laboratory physicists here, uh, but, you know, despite the fact that uh, if you talk to an experimentalist, they are going to tell you that their best vacuum is 10 to the 5. <laughs> you, you're going to tell them that we study, there's still a lot going on below that in the cosmological uh, volume. And the temperature is the same. So this vast scale uh, is really hard, uh, not for the theorists, not only for the theorists, but for observers as well. So just to uh, you know, brief, briefly introduce what kind of signals we can target. This is a very nice article I really liked written by Rob Sinko for the Scientific Americans back in 2004, despite the uh, you know, time, some time has passed. I still continue to use this cartoon because really just to show the uh, electron levels in the upper right. Uh, just to remind you uh, that uh, as the electrons jump up and down, even for a simple hydrogen, uh, it's gonna produce photons or uh, reduce photons. Uh, so in this panel, you can see if the electron is, um, is excited, it's gonna uh, come down and emit a photon. Uh, and we know from emission measure, this kind of signal goes with density squared. So there is a bit of bias, well, bias. Uh, it traces high density region, just like all the emission line diagnostics you have heard uh, earlier. Uh, in uh, conversely, uh, when the photon when a photon comes in, uh, it will excite a ground state particle and then um, once they uh, and absorb the photon, so it's gonna create a, a dent uh, in the incoming spectrum, and that's the uh, uh, coupled with the expansion of the universe, uh, the absorption features is gonna spread out uh, over the entire spectrum of the background light. But uh, so while emission measure goes with density square, that's what's uh, making it really hard coupled with the uh, you know, four pi dilution factor. 
uh, absorption is very sensitive. It goes with density linearly. So that's just to give you an idea. And then uh, this is why I planned after a brief uh, tour on line profile analysis, we're gonna uh, look into what we can do based on emission detections and absorption measurements. So just to uh, remind you, for those who have, uh, I mean, actually you have heard this earlier, but maybe uh, just to reiterate that the favorite equation in the ISM, um, maybe fundamental equation, maybe not favorite, is the radiator transfer. Uh, basically the two terms on the right uh, captures both absorption and emission. And for the, in the case of absorption, the total opacity goes with uh, integrated column density uh, multiplied by the cross section of uh, absorption or ionization. And a lot of information is really swept under this one term. Uh, when we talk about opacity, it's really frequency dependent. So, and uh, this phi parameter, this line profile is not the delta function, um, thanks to modern physics. And so the question is really, what is uh, making a non-delta? So there are, uh, I don't know, how many people have heard this before? What are the line broadening mechanisms? Yes? Oh, okay. Sorry, what? Pressure broadening, all right? But more specifically, what pressure? There are a lot of different uh, pressure terms. Demo. Okay, yes. I want to make sure I didn't hear it because I want to hear it. Uh, so let me just start from the uh, the other side, intrinsic line width. Uh, this is the basic uh, quantum physics because of the finite lifetime of the upper level, it serves as essentially a damping term. And uh, that's the Lorentzian profile some of you may be very familiar with. Uh, so this gamma, so I, I, I need to apologize beforehand. Uh, astronomers, maybe you have realized now, are not very creative. So we use the same symbol for different terms. So just remember, gamma here is damping coefficient. Uh, so it's a coefficient, so don't worry about it. What I want you to pay attention to is the profile shape. If it's uh, intrinsic width dominated, then the profile will go with delta nu square inverse, inverse square. Um, and then thermal broadening uh, is really following Brownian motion. So it's captured by Maxwellian distribution. And what I want you to remember is the width goes with uh, temperature and the mass. So if I really spell that out, this is typically defined as Doppler parameter, you know, Doppler shift that will shift the frequency and how that will connect to the line of sight, velocity dispersion uh, according to the root two. Uh, factor. So again, this is another potential confusion here. Sigma here, instead of uh, cross-section, is even on the same slide. Uh, not to mention this nu and v look very similar, but this is velocity dispersion. All right. Uh, so, so one thing I want to highlight is really the Doppler width, Doppler parameter goes with uh, um, temperature uh, root two of the temperature and also inversely related to the particle mass. That, and that serves as a very valuable uh, tool. If we can observe transitions, lines from two different uh, particles with very different mass, there's a chance for us to actually determine the temperature and uh, otherwise bulk motion independently and very precisely. So I need you to remember Doppler parameter there are two uh, fact, independent factors. One is the bulk flow, whatever that might be, could be turbulence, could be Hubble flow, and uh, temperature, all right? And more massive particles will have narrower thermal term, but bulk motion is constant, shared among all particles of different mass. So that's, you're gonna hear about this again. So, uh, so now going back, to, you know, using lemma alpha emission as an example, um, you know, we, we haven't talked about the emission term, you know, going back, remember the radiative transfer equation, uh, the second term is the source term. So we know that for photonization, uh, it's balanced under equilibrium, it's balanced by recombination. There's a whole ca cascade of uh, actions happening and every cascade emits a photon. Uh, toward the bottom, we see uh, lemma alpha. And you can work out the emission coefficient, uh, which is, you know, the energy term times the, 
this is a density square that I was talking about plus the coefficient, uh, recombination coefficient. And specifically for lemma alpha, you probably have heard case A, case B. Just remember that there's optically thick versus optically thin. The difference is everything combined down directly to the ground state may be reabsorbed. That's the optically thick case. And uh, that will involve two different, as you can imagine, if it's optically thick, reprocessing will generate many, many more lemma, lemma alpha photons. So this is the emission uh, intensity that we would expect. We can easily convert that to the surface brightness that we expect to detect. Uh, so here, you know, I have quickly re uh, replaced the electron density term with uh, what we know about the solar composition. I mean, the cosmic composition between helium and uh, hydrogen. So, you know, don't worry about it. Um, but then the other, um, uh, you know, hydrogen particle density term is integrated over the path lens and this now becomes uh, calm density. Uh, so why do I write this down? Uh, it's really because you saw earlier, you know, direct imaging of lemma alpha photons. This is the signal we expect to, to see. And uh, certainly the one plus e to the fourth power, that's the cosmological deeming. Um, so I don't know if there's any, uh, there are theorists in the audience, just in case you don't yell at me, uh, because the density are certainly uh, inhomogeneous. So the signal depends on the counting factor. So I did consider counting factor, but I drop it. So consider counting factor uh, as unity here. But you know, if you want to really care, if you really care about uh, clumping uh, median, this is how you are gonna correct the prediction. So um, we can play around with uh, the uh, math a little bit, just to remind yourself that under photoionization equilibrium, uh, the uh, neutral fraction can be uh, balanced, is easily balanced by the recombination, the product of uh, this term here. And we can rewrite uh, this equation to, uh, to see, hopefully you can see quickly that uh, under optically thin scenario, your expected lemma alpha signal does not depend on, on the strength of your ionizing source. The ionization uh, uh, rate is uh, canceled out due to the neutral fraction, you know, the full ionization equilibrium. So if you, if there's a reason for you to think that the medium is optically thin, you can directly use the observed surface brightness to infer the underlying total calm density. But uh, in the optically thick case, it's different. Um, because, you know, when the gas is optically thick, really you only expect the skin layer of the cloud to be ionized. But as the source become, the ionizing source becomes stronger, you expect that skin layer gets thickened. And then you expect to um, have brighter lemma alpha signal. So there's the, the caveat, but then there's, once you, um, you know, get into the optically thick regime, there's other uh, complications that, uh, happens. So oftentimes you need to use simulation to educate, to adjust uh, the coefficient. That's the, the geometry, sorry, that's the uh, geometry factor here. But this is the reason why if you look at the literature, people tend to look for lemma alpha emitting blob near a quasar because the expectation is for optically thick clouds, like all the high velocity clouds that people have detected in the Milky Way or in nearby galaxies. These are all optically thick uh, gas. So it happens to occur, reside in uh, the vicinity of the bright ionizing source, there's a chance to detect, detect them. And uh, this is um, long pursued in the extragalactic community. Uh, and that's why when people find a giant lemma of a blob in the middle of nowhere, it's a tremendous interest. Um, so now hopefully you know why. So this is just a really quick uh, intro about you know, what the expectation is for absorption, what is the emission signal. So now we combine everything together uh, just to take a, a slightly more detailed look about what happens to a lemma alpha photon when it's generated. So just a quick reminder that I don't know, uh, 
you may be familiar with photoionization. Some of you may even remember the uh, photoionization cross-section for hydrogen. Uh, but uh, one thing I want to note is for lemma alpha absorption, the cross-section is even greater. So when we talk about optically thin gas, usually that's based on the ionization properties. Uh, but because the cross -action, absorption cross-action for lemma alpha transition is 10,000 times larger. So even for optically thin gas to ionizing photons, they could be optically thick to lemma alpha photons. That's something to remember. And that makes everybody's life very complicated. What happens when a lemma alpha photon is generated? It likes to interact with the, it likes to make friends. Uh, so this is a cartoon uh, to show you what, what happens. So a photon, you know, an electron drops down to the ground state, you meet the photon in any random uh, direction. And uh, when you hit a particle, which will not be static, you know, ISM, or I should say CGM is just like ISM. Uh, their sound speed, particles are moving around like crazy. On average, you know, sound speed is 10 kilometers per second for 10 to the four Kelvin gas. So hit a particle, it's gonna transfer momentum and it's just gonna be doing random walk, not only in space, but in frequency. So it's gonna offset in frequency uh, and also just happens within the volume. So th the end result is roughly speaking. Uh, so if we just start from the top, forget about motions. Um, if we can produce a static medium, what you would expect is at the line core, remember the 10,000 times larger opacity will basically produce, you know, if the input line shape is like a, a nice Gaussian in the red uh, or dot dash dotted curve here, being processed with this optically thick, lemma alpha thick medium, you're gonna see this double hump feature. Now, if we add motion to the gas, starting from infall. So if the source, you know, I play the source in the middle. So by the way, this is a cartoon borrowed from uh, Yan Edo uh, in 2014. I, I really like the uh, presentation, but uh, so I didn't make it. Uh, but the point is if the source is in the middle and the gas is falling in. So from the gas perspective, the photons are blue shifted. That means the resonant frequency is gonna happen in the in the red. So the wavelength is to the right here. The photons are blue shifted. Resonant frequency moved to the red. So you see this asymmetry profile now. The blue peak becomes stronger. Uh, that's because the resonant frequency occurs in the red. You know, but going backwards, you know, if this outflow is expanding, the gas sees the photon red shifted. So the frequency, the resonant frequency is shifted to the blue. And that's why you see the enhanced red peak. So this becomes tremendously valuable. If you see the profile, don't worry about flux calibration. Maybe not worrying so much about wavelength calibration. You know right away what is the kinematics here. So that makes it really convenient and yet very hard to really interpret uh, because of every complication you can imagine that happens in the gas. So, but, you know, qualitatively speaking, we can say roughly speaking that uh, the separation between the two peaks, roughly speaking, uh, is determined by the total H1 column density. Um, and uh, the peak ratio is driven by the velocity differential. So in this case, I use expansion. So, but you know, if you flip the sign, it's the same. So, I mean, having said that, you know, there's a reason why uh, I focus on lemma alpha because uh, you're gonna see that lemma alpha is really the brightest line coming out of diffuse gas. Uh, so, but in the optical uh, where we are more familiar with uh, nebula lines, forbidden lines, what about H alpha also from hydrogen? Do we expect to see this? I'm not gonna tell you, but you can come talk to me later. So having just remember uh, everything you heard, so now we're gonna move into just a brief tour about what we have learned about uh, from emission measure. So this is a quick uh, gallery. Uh, you've seen a version of this yesterday. 
uh, on the right, this is the optical, uh, typical optical spectrum of a star forming region. Uh, so you are very familiar with H alpha and uh, you know, there are all kinds of Balmer series and there's also O3 uh, doublet for binal lines. Um, but maybe you are less familiar with the UV and for a reason, I mean, UV, um, you, you don't see as many lines here instead you, uh, you don't see as many emission lines here, but there are a lot of absorption. But I just want to point out that, you know, things you are familiar with like O3, um, you know, silicon 3 they all have their counter UV counterpart. They're just not as strong, but uh, just to highlight how strong, how much stronger lama alpha is. So, but, uh, so I'm gonna come back to that. So just to go from, you know, there are so many different directions I can choose to, to go with the lecture. So I decided in the end uh, to start from the nearby universe. So just to a, a quick tour about what we have learned uh, in terms of the circumgalactic medium properties. I want to go back to talking about extraplanetary gas, specifically on ionized gas. And the reason for that really is it has the, it encoded all the information that's inherited from past current star formation activities and also accretion. This is the first interface that we encounter moving from interstellar medium outward to the intergalactic medium. So I want to start here. Um, so this, this uh, nice picture is the all sky image of the Milky Way. I mean, it's the all sky image and it's the Milky Way. Uh, I hope you, and this is H alpha, this is narrowband filter produced by the uh, Madison group in the US. Um, I hope uh, it's clear to you that uh, the Milky Way disk is thin uh, in the mid plan. And what you can take away from this is there's this puff, puffed up uh, ionized layer from the uh, from the mid plan. Um, that's um, kind of dramatic if you think about the energetics. And um, people have uh, done a lot of work, uh, as you can see here. This is um, this has been known for some time, and uh, they continue to study this uh, you know this this so-called edict. And typical property, as you can see, uh, temperature is typical, ten to the four Kelvin. Density is um, low or high, depending on where you come from. It's of order 0.05 uh, particles per cubic centimeter, and it's fully ionized. And the volume filling uh, is not unity. And uh, so, uh, what people are finding is also, you know, we have we know all the disk galaxies. We can measure the rotation curve, but for this extended uh, layer, there's a velocity drag and tends to uh, conform to the uh, systemic velocity. And there's a very large scale height in comparison to 0 0.1, 0 0.3 KPC is one KPC. That in itself uh, is an important clue. And uh, when we look at line ratio, you guys have heard a lot about uh, line diagnostics. Um, this is also elevated. It tells you there's additional ionizing mechanism. So we just want to take a, a, a really simple uh, uh, you know, look at how what's required to generate such large uh, scale height. Uh, just, you know, I'm an observer, just uh, look at very simple uh, equations. If you just want to consider hydrostatic equilibrium, uh, this is what you would get. But it does at least, uh, so for any fixed uh, gravitational potential with a uh, known density profile, you can imagine how the pressure gradient is set. And the pressure here can be uh, gas, you know, having heard many talks, can I ignore magnetic field? Can I ignore cosmic rays? So they all contribute to the pressure. Uh, but uh, to connect the observables to all the physical quantities, uh, you are gonna need uh, this sort of equation of state, uh, you know, connecting uh, density and uh, velocity to the expected gas pressure. So if I just ignore uh, magnetic field and cosmic ray uh, for now, uh, just really focusing on the um, gas kinematics. Again, similar to line profile, not absorption line profile here, you can also imagine the velocity dispersion is uh, composed of two terms, uh, thermal and non uh, turbulent motion. 
So this is just a, a small project a grad student at Chicago did targeting this NGC 3511, um, a nearby adjunct highly inclined uh, star forming galaxy with long slit spectroscopy in collaboration with Aaron Betcher, uh, who's not at Goddard. Really high, high signal to noise spectrum of all the nebula lines. And uh, Han Jue Zhu did a careful job to decompose uh, the lines uh, trying to decide whether there's a broad component, trying to extract uh, the presence of a broad component. And what she said uh, naturally is indeed is there. Not only that, she can determine the velocity centroid very well. And just like what other people find for NGC and A91 uh, and uh, a few other disk, nearby disk galaxies, the broad components you know, are lagging behind the main disk and it's toward the systemic velocity of the gas. So when we play with this, you know, this is also part of Aaron Betcher's PhD thesis. Uh, it's really very similar to what she found for M83 and uh, a few other galaxies as well. Uh, when Aaron did this, she started from the basic uh, expectation, just considering gas alone and compare with the expected, I mean, the observed, this is set by the observed velocity dispersion. You know, once you have this, you can uh, work out the pressure gradient that's shown in the vertical axis here. So given the expected pressure gradient from the observed velocity dispersion, so now we can play the game about starting adding the component one at a time. So when she started adding thermal, it's, notice, it's obviously insufficient. But even after adding the turbulent velocity that we measured from the broad component is still missing two thirds. So what is contributing to the broad line profile? Uh, so there's extensive discussion on this, including magnetic field and cosmic rays. I would just refer you to the reference here. Um, but you know, so there are additional uh, problems with every scenario here. So I don't have time to go over that. I just encourage you to read that. But alternatively, you know, there's also non-equilibrium, more dynamic model, which is known as the galactic fountain flow. So the idea of galactic fountain flow has been known for uh, a couple of decades, but really worked out in great detail with the aid of uh, numerical simulation by um, a few others, including Filippo Fratinelli here. So I encourage you to read his uh, review chapter from the same volume that uh, I wrote for the Oscar, study outskirts of galaxies using absorption spectroscopy. What you can see here, what Filippo uh, included here is taking into account star uh, burst driven outflows. Uh, things are driven out of the disk plan. As it slows down, it's gonna you know, slowly migrate outward and mixing with the hot halo. So everything you put, out, put into the hot halo is producing exceeding density uh, inhomogeneity and then trigger thermal instability. And that's what you see here. So along the way, Filippo's observation of the simulation was it's gonna uh, bring more material back. Uh, the modern term of galactic fountain flow appears to be wind, wind accretion. Uh, and then as things fall down, accelerate and coming back to the halo. So this is uh, a way uh, to explain this kind of uh, added pressure. So again, I will just refer you uh, to, to the review article to get more um, in-depth understanding. But, you know, between equilibrium, you know, including magnetic field and cosmic ray, or this more dynamic picture. Uh, so this is still very much ongoing research, but the data um, is really uh, difficult to get. The kind of, I, I had no idea in my career, this is the largest signal to noise I have ever got, gotten um, in my life for my research. It's really hard. So now moving on from the nearby universe, we cannot do this um, most of the time uh, once we move beyond the uh, um, nearby universe. Really it's because of the you know, density square dependence. The signal gets so thin, but occasionally we get lucky. Uh, so this is one example uh, that I found in the archive. It didn't cost me a, a dime. It's really just sitting there uh, in the uh, VLT Muse archive. And it's about the system people have known for decades. So there's this really large Damplama absorbers with H1 condensate uh, exceeding 10 to the 21. So this is very typical. I mean, this is 
more than the typical ISM that you see in the Milky Way. It's very high column density. And the uh, metallicity is about a tenth uh, solar. And you can see here, this is uh, you know HST spectrum, kind of low resolution, so it doesn't look very impressive, but enough that uh, we know the H1 column density is very high. And many group, actually including myself, uh, has studied this, uh, trying to find galaxies responsible for this. This is a very high quality E-shell absorption spectra that people have gotten using UVS on the VLT. And there are many transitions due to magnesium to the single ionized magnesium, uh, even neutral medium, single ionized iron, manganese, calcium, and titanium. So I know this is really a lot dumping on you, but just take my words for it. it they are, th the absorber is resolved into at least six components, six distinct components at different velocity. And if you look at the point is comparing component ratio, there's clear depletion differential between these components separated by merely 50 compound per second. So this is a very dynamic system, lots of dust uh, uh, properties, variations along the line of sight, um, um, and highly neutral. So people have tried so hard to find the uh, uh, galaxy counterparts, and uh, every few years you get you see a paper on this, and then every few years you get more galaxies in the environment. So it turns out this is a galaxy group. And this is highlighted here uh, with two spiral looking galaxies. You probably can see even the tidal tail. So there's some hint, even just by looking at the galaxy alone. And uh, uh, just you know, back in 2019, uh, I just uh, happened to look at the archive. And uh, this field was targeted by Muse uh, for a couple hours, uh, just to repeat the, uh, the image here. And Muse added a few more galaxies, all low mass dwarfs. But all together, we can constrain the velocity dispersion to be about 130 kilometers per second and infer the mass to be about three times 10 to the 12 solar mass. That's just slightly more massive than the Milky Way or the local group. What was surprising is when we look into the lines, we see widespread line emitting gas. And this is the movie I made. I can just stare at this uh, all day sitting in front of my computer. I just want to point out that you see all the empty space in the deep image, deep HSC image. We saw extended line emission. Uh, th in this particular case is oxygen three, five double eight. Uh, but we see multiple lines um, that summarized here. Uh, so at the top, you can see the equation. That's just a modification from the lemma alpha uh, surface brightness you had seen earlier, just replacing it to the appropriate recombination coefficient. And with that, you can infer the mean density about 0.2. So it's really uh, relatively high density for the intergalactic, for the circumgalactic space. And then allowing uh, clumping factor, th there's maybe a factor of few offset. But this is just to show you again, just overlay the contour of H alpha emission on top of the HST image, just to give you a sense of how it, the gas is spread uh, between galaxies and uh, repeated with O2, O3, and H alpha. Um, so when we look at the velocity map, this is what's seen in this uh, uh, image on the right here. There's a down the sideline in the middle, that's the quasar. Uh, that's where the absorption spectra were taken. And on top of that dot, we can see H alpha emission squarely on top of the uh, absorption component. So it's a very good kinematic match. Sadly, the resolution is not as good. So there's still a long way to go, but it's very encouraging that uh, we see line emitting gas, at least on the sky, coincident with the absorption components that we see. Uh, really provides strong support for the idea that the, the DLA we see here is not part of a rotation disk, it's not part of the dwarf, but part of the stream, uh, uh, strip gaseous stream out of the interacting galaxy group. Uh, so with multiple lines, we can do more. This is the familiar BPT diagram on the right. Uh, just to show you that for galaxies, these are star forming galaxies that are marked by the blue star symbols here. They fall nicely on top of the star forming uh, branch. 
But when we look at the extended gas region, just looking at the O2 to uh, O3 to H beta ratio, you see this, they uh, branch out into the AGM side. So one thing we can know for sure is there's no AGN detected, but who knows whether there's AGN in the past 100 million years. Uh, some theorists like to give us a trouble, uh, but there's uh, to, similar to the edict layer, there's clearly additional ionizing source, either being shock or uh, you know AGN flickering, uh, that still remains to be determined. But this is one very nice case. I, ha uh, I really wish to find more, uh, but um, there's a, now the reason why I prefer the shock scenario is really because it helped enhance the emission brightness uh, from this otherwise diffuse gas. Um, so moving further to the distant universe due to the observational constraint, we cannot rely on optical nebula lines anymore. So now we're going back to the lovely lemma alpha line. Remember, it really likes to interact uh, with the surrounding, especially with uh, the integral field spectrograph available on CAG and the VOT. Uh, there are a lot of uh, lemma alpha blob or nebulae detected in the literature. And this is one example uh, done by the KBSS group at Caltech. Uh, this is one low mass galaxy, relatively metal poor at ratio uh, 2.3 is tiny. This is an HST image. Uh, doesn't really tell you how tiny it is, but you can see that the half life radi radius is about 1.5 kpc. So when Don Herb uh, at Milwaukee uh, took a chance at this with a KCWI uh, time, this is what she found. She can get spatially resolved lemma alpha line. And you can see that at the center of the source, this is the classic double peak lemma alpha profile. So remember what this asymmetry tell you, enhanced red peak. Somebody, I cannot wait. Static, did you see? It's expanding. Static will be equal height. Expanding, uh, the photons are, uh, I mean, the gas sees blue shifted photons. So, you know, the resonant frequency shifted uh, to the blue. So, so this is enhanced red peak. And what, what found, I found interesting is toward the outskirt, she sees flipped uh, line profile. So this is infall. So I, this, is, this is the kind of study that people are, I, I hope to see more. And we can actually try, despite the fact that we don't really know much about the underlying dense distribution because of the inherent um, limitation. Uh, but hopefully with the advanced model computation, we can try to really combine the kinematics with a uh, uh, multi-phase media to, to extract real uh, information. So what we have done uh, at Chicago, again, is just uh, to utilize archival data. Uh, this is a grad student, Mandy Chan. Uh, Chicago, she noticed this giant lemma alpha arc in a paper published by Kaminha and company back in 2017. Uh, so Mandy was inherently drawn to this giant gravitational arc, uh, but she was really uh, creative to connect her interest with the uh, research, saw the giant lemma arc uh, and try to, to really see what is going on here. Uh, so. So she did a very extensive gravitational modeling and uh, trying to de-lens the observation back to the source plan. So what you see here is a, a small group of galaxies at redshift three, multiply lensed into three different images along the arc by this foreground cluster at uh, point four. And uh, so when we look at just lemma alpha signal alone, we see this extended double lobe feature bracketing or surrounding this small group of galaxies. There's one, two, three. And, but when we look into the galaxy spectra in more detail, uh, this is a very familiar DLA feature coming out of the ISM of the galaxy. We notice that there's a bit of leakage of lemma alpha at the uh, deep in the trough. So after we remove the DLA, we extracted the lemma alpha signal, put it back to the image. This is what we see. 
even after the careful effort, uh, we still see a clear gap between the northern and southern lobe. So this in itself is very interesting um, because when we look a couple of the, the morphology with the kinematics, when we look into the profile, there's clearly an offset, even though they are similarly asymmetric with enhanced red peak, but overall there's a shear. So with that, we can construct this uh, velocity field and uh, along the lemma alpha block. And we found that there's the steep velocity gradient that resembles what we would expect of a supergalactic wind being launched from these star forming galaxies. So this was, you know, just a, a toy model just to show the potential of such uh, data. So just quickly coming back to uh, slightly lower redshift. Remember I said earlier that uh, there's a reason why people try to target quasar host environment because of the monster in the middle of the halo. It enhances the probability of finding uh, signals out of the emission due to the diffuse gas. And indeed, that's why people found that for high range of quasar host halos, 100% of the time, people see this giant lemma alpha block. Uh, but because of the caveat, it's just really difficult to determine whether the photon is coming in situ or it's being scattered from the inner source. And it makes a huge difference in terms of the inferred mass. But at low redshift, you know, in order to, do, to study the physics of the gas, we have to move out of the resident lines. That's why we moved to lower redshift, looking for nebula lines, like uh, you know, forbidden O3, O2 emissions or uh, Balmer transitions. We only found one third of the time uh, for quasar uh, at redshift less than one that shows this kind of uh, extended emission. This is work done by Sean Johnson at University of Michigan. But uh, so there's the question about whether this is due to evolution or really is in the nature of lemma alpha that is something people don't understand yet. But that's really a valuable lesson. But focusing on the low redshift source alone, we can see that um, the ionization condition shows a strong gradient as the gas moves away from the central source. So it really shows that at least for this, in this case, we can determine the ionization condition very well. We can attempt to determine the gas density and coupled with the uh, velocity gradient. Based on uh, what we, we are seeing now for the low redshift source, there is a clear correlation between the presence of extended gas and the galactic environment. So the question about you know, quasar nebulae being coming out of quasar driven wind is um, may need to be revisited. So before we break, uh, I want to really touch quickly on um, our latest attempt of utilizing this kind of spatially resolved velocity map to try to constrain the turbulence uh, velocity field in, uh, you know, in any of these halos. But right now, given the, uh, you know, the most de detections coming out of the quasars, we are looking at quasar host halos first. And just a, a quick, uh, Reminder of the turbulence you have heard last week. Uh, the Kolmogorov relation can be uh, tested directly determined using this velocity structure function. In particular, for the second order velocity structure function, you know, just taking the quadrature of the velocity difference. You can imagine this is just measuring velocity variance on different scales, forming pairs, just to measure how different the velocities are. If it's really due to energy cascade, you will see a correlation following a particular power law. This was uh, first done by Yuan Li back in 2020 on intracluster medium. She found, um, she was also analyzing archival data and found all these h alpha filaments. And then she just attempted to measure uh, the first order velocity structure function for three clusters. And what she found was uh, the slope are steeper than Kolmogorov. And that was, uh, that has been a puzzle uh, even though they are now, after uh, over the last three years, there are a few papers coming out trying to explain the steeper uh, slope. But uh, there are also others using numerical simulations uh, to, to emphasize the complication of interpreting this kind of measurement. In particular on the ground, because of the scene, introducing correlation between different scales, it's easily uh, uh, conceivable that 
the velocity structure function is deepened as a result of PSF smoothing. And this was demonstrated in our latest paper uh, led by Mandy Chan. So in our case, we measure, we try to do the similar experiment using this giant quasar nebulae uh, found at redshift one. Uh, you can see this is spanning across a hundred parsecs around the quasar. And there's again, a noticeable galaxy group here. What we found was really uh, very surprising to me. Uh, it's a spectacular um, Kolmogorov relation, two thirds power law for the uh, second order after convolved with the PSF, we directly measure from the, uh, from the data itself. And it's spent over between about eight KPC out to 60 KPC. So unfortunately, this is the limitation that we have from the scene on the ground. Uh, so this is still a surprise to me because um, by definition, uh, uh, Kolmogorov uh, energy cascade is uh, applicable for uh, isotropic homogeneous and incompressible fluid. Uh, here you can see the velocity scale is tremendous. Uh, given the typical temperature, one would expect the, uh, the um, velocity is uh, supersonic. And yet we see this very nice match to the, to the uh, expectation from incompressible fluid. We also try to measure higher order um, um, velocity structure function just to see how much the extent, uh, you know, uh, the PDF will change from the uh, natural Gaussian. But anyway, so, um, so I think uh, I would just summarize quickly about the emission uh, way late. Uh, so basically starting from the nearby universe, you know, following exoplanet gas, uh, we can uh, try to get a, a direct picture of the circulation of baryons coming out of the star forming region and uh, out into the halo. And now we're slowly making progress in trying to pin down the physical condition based on direct emission. The additional information we can get from morphology is really tremendous. Uh, but really looking into the future in order to enhance what we already know, especially relying on lemma alpha signal alone, large format integral field unit in the infrared really is uh, very valuable. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to harmony on the ELT uh, in a few years of time. So I'm gonna stop here briefly if you have any questions before I move on. Questions? Um, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, my question is, uh, you were talking about uh, these damped Lyman alpha absorbers, and I was wondering, um, well, the ones you were talking about have an emission counterpart, and with those you were able to um, see like outflows and inflows, but I'm wondering if there's a way that you can um, identify outflows and inflows in DLAs without the emission counterpart. Yes, uh, that, that's coming up in the absorption in the next session. So I think um, it's a combination of information. Right now we're looking at from the emission measure, what we're trying to look at is kinematics, just you know trying to constrain the flow pattern. But additional uh, parameter space will be chemical abundance and the abundance pattern. Um, that I think is a direct connection to, you know, the star formation history, whether this is newly generated or uh, there's contribution from evolved stars, everything Chiaki said last week. Thank you. And that's more on absorption spectroscopy. Um, I have a question about uh, the exoplanar diffused ionized gas. So in that study with NGC 3511, um, I stand to be corrected, but I think that's a highly inclined galaxy. So sort of how much of a limitation is the inclination of the galaxy when sort of studying the kinematics because of projection effects, for example. Yeah, so yeah, highly inclined, we'll try to take that into account. Uh, it's not fully inclined. So there's a little bit of uh, leverage. If I remember correctly, it's actually about, just about 45, 50 degrees. Yeah. So the, the, you know, there's the special correlation within that kernel, we took that into account. Other questions? down at the bottom. Oh. 
rates. I was just curious to know what's the info rate on the Milky Way of the CDM. What is the... The info rate, the mass inflow rate. Uh, I'm not sure if we know, but um, I mean, there infer there's inference, you know, the star formation rate going on between one to three solar mass a year. Um, so that's that's the bottom line. But then you take into account star formation inefficiency. Uh, so I guess that's a lower limit. But the infall, it also depends on whether you are looking at neutral gas or ionized gas. It's highly uncertain. I think looking into our own backyard is hard. But then in other galaxies, is it a large fraction per year of, uh, of, of solar mass? In our own galaxy? No, uh, in elsewhere. In, in other, other galaxies. galaxies. Do we know about the accretion yes. rate? So it's really a tough question. Uh, one thing people talk about is while the idea, our expectation is things are falling in, but we never really directly detect accretion. And I have another question. Um, any hint of molecular, uh, it's, it's only ionized and uh, atomic hydrogen or any hint of having some molecular gas? Well, I, will show, I will talk about uh, molecular gas in the, so emission is difficult. Uh, but you are right that there are people using ALMA to try to detect uh, extended em uh, CO emission. Uh, those are rare and uh, a lot of discussion about whether it's connected to AGN, um, somewhat star burst systems, but those are rare. So that's why there are a lot of interest. They are detected, but um, only on special cases. It's okay, I will just move on. Um, I guess we'll, uh, you'll go until 10 till the half hour, so. Maybe 10, 15, so we end at 10, 30? 10, 30. Is it? Yeah, yeah. so you go till, you, uh, we could do 10 minutes of questions at the end. Right, then. okay, so yeah, depends, okay. Um, yeah, I understand this is not uh, something uh, that's uh, very familiar to many people here, but um, just want to convey as much as, but uh, I just want to uh, clarify that there's really a vast field out there. Uh, what I, what you hear today is by no means everything people are doing, as, especially as uh, Jerome just mentioned, uh, there are people trying to look for CO detection, uh, mainly at high rate shift. It's definitely, it's, th there's definitely ongoing work on that. All right, so moving on uh, to the absorption techniques. Uh, so what I like to, you know, uh, you know, the talk is organized just to follow roughly the flow, starting from, um, you know, what are the necessary ingredients in ionization modeling uh, to what we can learn about thermodynamics and chemical enrichment. Uh, again, you know, and one thing I, I, I was really glad about coming here is, you know, hearing all the talks on tur turbulence was really uh, timely and educational to me. Uh, but just a quick uh, review about quasar absorption lines. Uh, there are many fancy cartoons you can find on Google. So this is just my version of it. Uh, in the background, you can see a nice composition from the Eagle simulation that combines gas density, temperature, and velocity. Uh, the blue sh streams are the cold gas coming in to feed potentially um, star formation in the middle. Green shows, you know, you can see this nice outflows down here. Uh, so imagine if there's a background source, maybe a quasar sitting in the middle of a cluster, shining through the space, encountering any ga gaseous streams or clouds along the way. They will imprint this kind of absorption line features in the spectrum of that background source. As you know, uh, it's well known about the Lama Alpha Forest. Hydrogen is, after all, the uh, most abundant uh, element in the universe. But for every, not every, but for many of these Lama Alpha lines, it also come with metal absorptions in different ionization states. Uh, 
like uh, O6, carbon-4, and magnesium-2. So going back to the temperature density diagram I showed at the beginning, I want you to think about uh, the kind of cooler phase, cooler denser phase, probed by magnesium-2, as opposed to hotter and um, lower density phase probed by oxygen-6, for example. And the value about high absorption, high spectral resolution, uh, is the ability to resolve these components, at least in velocity space. And this is an example to show you the highly ionized species, oxygen-6, really broad. You know, there's at least four components just by eye, maybe five, that goes from minus 400 kilometers per second to 200. Never mind the absolute velocity, but just think about the span. Uh, you know, in another case, we see this crazy system with, you know, easily 12, 15 components resolved in the high resolution spectrum uh, in the magnesium to low ion uh, study. Uh, so this is um, the kind of information that we have from absorption uh, spectra. And just to remind you, again, coming back to the density temperature diagram, you know, from minus 10 to the minus six to 100 particles again, Cosmological simulations repeatedly produce tell us where cosmic gas will lie in this phase space. ISM tends to be here even outside of this uh, this box, and most of the CGM goes along this curve, this arc here. And as you go to lower density and higher temperature, we move up in the ionization state of each element. So remember that. Um, it's more than just an alphabet soup. Um, so for many decades now, so Lama Alpha Forest have been studied since day one, since the first quasar was discovered, maybe a few years after that. Um, and a couple of decades after that, uh, people start looking into metal lines. This is an incomplete collection of all the references up to 10 years ago. You see this doesn't, uh, there's, there's nothing be after 2014. That doesn't mean people stop working on that. But there's a the, uh, fundamental limitation, which is this is by design a 1D probe. You only see one uh, beaming source and the quasar emitting region is less than one parsec. This is literally a pencil beam survey. And you have in encounter uh, several clouds along the line of sight and then with galaxies. One data point per halo it's really hard to pinpoint the direct physical connection. So instead, the tradition has been doing this kind of ensemble average. You target multiple galaxy quasar pairs and collapse to form this cosmic average. That's the idea. And uh, it's been focusing mainly on cross-section study. It's very simple if you think about it. You shoot for, you, you try to find for each galaxy quasar pair, you find the corresponding absorption, you know the separation. So you record the absorption strength on the y-axis as a function of projected distance. This, uh, these multiple panels shows from lemma alpha, which is hydrogen to low ions, carbon, car you know, carbon two and carbon four. Down here is silicon ions two, three, and four. One thing you can see, I hope clearly, without thinking too deeply about it is, you see uniformly a declining trend. As you go further out, you start to lose the signal, with one exception that's in the hydrogen. So this, at least the uh, the picture seems to show that there's the gradual decline in the chemical enrichment at least. Possibly ionization state, but it's hard to come up with ionization model with such sharp cutoff. So most likely is coupled with chemical enrichment and cloud formation physics. So, uh, People have spent um, you know, time to do this survey, trying to com com uh, combine the general property with the star formation history. And this is just one example to look at halos of different, I mean, galaxies of different mass that can translate to different halo mass. In this case, it was found that as we move from low mass star forming galaxy to high mass quiescent galaxies, the incidence of these cold clouds declined. And this is for low ions. And in, uh, in addition, if you look at the star formation history, this is showing uh, the equivalent width in H alpha, which is the same as star specific star formation history, star formation rate. 
you know, imagine H alpha as the indicator of star formation rate. The continuum serves as an estimate of the stellar mass. So the equivalent width is a direct proxy, direct proxy. It's a proxy of the specific star formation rate. And it looks like there's a clear, really positive correlation with the strength of the absorber, uh, with the covering fraction of the absorber and the uh, specific star formation rate. This is for low ions. And when we look into high ions like oxygen six, we see similar trend. Um, you can see for in this case, in comparison to simulations from low mass halos to high mass, we also see this, uh, you know, this kind of arch. There are also a uh, recent compilation from CGM square team uh, that also find very similar uh, conclusions. So now it's very simple. We see blue galaxies in more gas rich environment. Is this feeding or feedback? So naturally people uh, would directly jump on and say this is direct uh, evidence of outflow. Um, for me, I like to think uh, um, maybe not quite so simple, especially, you know, there's a clear evidence of the presence of cold gas, even in the massive quiescent and halo. Um, and, um, you know, what triggers star formation in the first place? You know, I think this is one of those key questions people ask, how do stars form if the galaxies are in inherited, I mean, located in a uh, gas rich environment, one would expect they are forming stars like crazy. So correlation is not ca causality. Uh, that's something to remember, but this really highlights the limitation of such approach. And people have also tried to push that down to really low mass regime. One thing we haven't heard much about in this uh, summer school, I think is really what's happening in low mass galaxies, both in the ISM and in the uh, halo gas. But we're trying to push down uh, to, you know, below 10 to the nine uh, solar mass regime just to see what's happening here. And the, the main motivation is really, um, if you have, you know, in my mind, these absorbers coming out of cool clouds condense out of the high halo. And the high, high halo will produce the pressure support for the uh, cold clouds. However, many of us, I mean, from the theory, we don't really expect a hot halo to form in these low mass halos. So where do these cold clouds come from? Really, that now we see in observations uh, is really a question. And I found that really interesting. Uh, so, so, but uh, just to, this is just a quick summary about what what else is going on using this very simple cross section. Think, despite the fact that this is uh, this doesn't provide much physics, but just even just to characterize the uh, incidence uh, and covering fraction has some uh, important meaning in that. But moving beyond cross section and really utilize the high spectral resolving power that we have, uh, what one can do is really to combine the expectation from ionization modeling. This is part of what the hands-on project group three has been doing for this week. But uh, so this is just an example to show you that I extracted from Ben Oppenheimer's paper in 2013. It shows the expectation of the ionization fraction for different species. Under at least three different scenarios, the CIE is collisionally ionization equilibrium. That's something some of you have done in the past few days. Given a fixed temperature, you know, that's in the x-axis, the expectation for different ion species uh, really depends on, as you go to higher temperature, you see more highly ionized species. Um, but then there's non-equilibrium condition, which is quite likely in the real universe. You can see that low ions, or I should say high ions, can be present in relatively low temperature. That's when the cooling time uh, really um, becomes larger, I mean, fast, shorter than uh, the recombination time. Uh, and then certainly simply, uh, there's also just simply photoionization equilibrium. For these three different scenarios, you can see the relative uh, expectations. And it's through that, we can try to constrain the density and uh, temperature of the gas. And uh, we can do that, especially with resolved components. Here, I just want to show you uh, I hope it's clear. 
there are six different panels. The top two are for hydrogen absorption profile, followed by carbon two, singly ionized carbon, nitrogen, and highly ionized O6. The message here is in the central component where you see dominant H1, you have corresponding low ions, nothing in oxygen six. In the satellite component, somewhat weaker hydrogen. You don't have low ions, but you have very strong oxygen six. So depending on whether this is photoionized or collisional ionized, the relative ionization, I mean, condensate ratio gives you a strong constraint on the physical condition of the gas. So that's the, but if you don't have the resol resolving power, if both components are blended, then, you know, there's a problem. So just quickly going through what are the necessary ingredients for actu accurate ionization models. Just to go back uh, to what I said earlier, in order to constrain the ionization condition, we need ions from different stage stages. Uh, in order to bracket uh, the, uh, the, not the parameters. So we, if we have a broad spectral coverage of both low, intermediate, and high ions, we'll be able to pin down on this temperature density phase space where the gas is. Because we know low ions tend to come out of here, intermediate ions in the middle, high ions on the top. So the relative ratio, abundance ratio is what we are looking for. And this is an uh, attempt to show you what we may be looking at. There's a whole suite of elements from magnesium, silicon, carbon, oxygen, um, all the way up to uh, there's also neon. So if we model the gas based on a single phase, meaning one density, we can reproduce the observations very well until we hit the high ions. And the mean density is 10 to the minus 2.5. But because of the presence of high ions, we know that there's additional phase, even though when the kinematics is a perfect match. So this is when we implemented a second phase at lower density. And uh, voila, we can uh, actually explain all of it. And the interesting thing is the high density phase wasn't too far off when we just assume a single phase. But we can only do that if when we have this kind of broad coverage. Imagine you don't have anything in the middle, you just have magnesium and uh, O3 and O4 the conclusion will be very different. And next is, again, going back to what I said earlier, using line width. Uh, remember, there's two fundamental different uh, mechanisms that will contribute to the line broadening. I mean, in terms of the just the line width central core. One is thermal, the other is non-thermal. It could be turbulence or bulk motion. And the thermal uh, term depends on temperature and mass of the particle in different ways. So this is just to illustrate for turbulent dominated, for bulk motion dominated case, you would expect to see similar line width for elements of very different mass. But for uh, thermal dominated uh, species, I mean, the gas condition, you will see the differential. So that's the idea. Irrespective of the ionization model that you adopt, just based on line width, you can see, you can pin down the temperature very well. And that's what we see if we just plot here in this case, magnesium versus hydrogen line, that uh, pure turbulent motion will lie on top of the upper line and pure thermal motion is at the bottom. And the measurements lie in between. And when we do that, we can cross check the assumption we made in ionization modeling. And this is what the, uh, what we did here, this is a postdoc at Chicago um, uh, So what you see here is the temperature measured from line width and density inferred from ionization, photoionization model. The photoionization was done under the assumption of photoionization equilibrium. And that in itself gives you a temperature constraint. And this is the, expect the that expectation is represented by the dashed, I mean dotted, the dotted curve here. 
the dash curve shows the best fit from the data itself. So this is a um, objective uh, check on the assumption, our assumption of photon ionization equilibrium. So now I can say confidently, in the past I can. Uh, one question is, you know, maybe it's collision. But now we can say very confidently that this is uh, photon ionization. So once we do take into account the component to component analysis, we can start to see the difference in the density as I showed earlier. In a single system, we can see in this case, the differential in the component line uh, component ratio. And I just want to point out that, you know, all the systems are grouped by color. Similar, same color are from the same uh, halos. So just multiple components identified in the same halo. There's a large spread in the absolute abundance enrichment within the same halo and large spread in the density, inferred density. This goes back to we are getting very close to the reality that uh, the simulation people have produced that now we're really seeing real world that uh, the medium is really clumpy. Not only that, chemical enrichment is also very inhomogeneous. So I'm gonna move on. Um, so once we take into account, so what is the picture here? I know many of you may have been uh, lost, but just want to paint the picture for you in your mind that the, all the different components that uh, we see in absorption spectra come out of the clumps I envision that are floating around in the halo. And as you go move away from the, into the outskirt, the density pressure profile drops, the clouds may be expanding a little bit and um, you see lower density, larger, uh, cloud size. And that's the idea for each system. We, we um, resolve the absorption system into multiple clumps and then reproject back to the 3D profile. This, is, this has significant uh, implication on that. It's because of this careful component decomposition and ionization analysis that we are able to really tabulate the baryon content in the individual halo. And uh, in contrast, if you don't do that, this is the initial result from cost halos back in 2014, using integrated comp density ratio. Their inferred density for the cool clumps is two orders of magnitude lower than the highest density clump that we have derived for the same system. And at the time, people were very excited about seeing clumps with density comparable to the high halo, how could they survive? Because the pressure is 100 times larger. This triggered uh, a lot of interest on exploring the possibility of magnetic field cosmic ray support. So I, but I just want to be clear that even though now we're seeing denser clumps embedded in the same system, does not say that we don't need magnetic field or cosmic rays. It's just different magnitude, different degree uh, of you know, influence. But it's really important, the, the value that we get out of high resolution spectroscopy is enormous. But in order to get the ionization right, there's one key component, that's the ionization field. And that's also part of the hands-on project. So maybe I will just skip. Uh, you can see the systematics. Uh, different ionizing spectrum will have different ionization intensity and the uh, uh, lemma edge. And that will result in different inferred density. And this is the differential you can see, given the difference between two different spectra, the uh, inferred density is proportionally different. And most importantly, the metallicity will have differential impact. That's just something, uh, you know, you're welcome to look at this slide later. Uh, we are also seeing uh, particular local fluctuation in the ionization radiation field. I'm gonna skip uh, to chemical enrichment because I think this is, I, I'm very interested in this. Uh, in doing all the ionization models, the first thing I said is the broad spectral coverage of all the ions. But in order to match the ion abundance between oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, iron, 
there's an assumption of what kind of abundance pattern we need to use in the model. People start with solar, but solar is by no means the standard. We heard a very nice uh, talk by Chiaki last week. We know that in stars, in stellar atmosphere, the elemental abundance is not solar. It depends on the metallicity. We also know in H2 region that the abundance pattern is not solar, especially at low metallicity regime. And we have seen a hint of non-solar abundance pattern in massive elliptical halos. In this particular case, this is the iron enhanced. If you remember Chiarchi's talk, you know, iron uh, comes out of late type evolved stars. Uh, you don't really expect iron to catch up with alpha elements until later. Here, complete uh, um, in, the, uh, in the flip side of things, we see enhanced iron uh, abundance in massive halos. So we have been doing this in this uh, cosmic ultraviolet baryon survey that uh, I've been running for the past uh, five, six years. Uh, this is massive data set that we have collected out of 15 quasar fields. This is the initial result that we got from trying to pin down the elemental abundance pattern. On the left, you can see again, iron to alpha versus metallicity represented by alpha to H. In the middle is nitrogen to alpha, and on the right is carbon to alpha. So this, this nice signature that people see in stars, uh, you know, just include it here for reference. Uh, so again, this is painstaking process. We do one system at a time, but already we see something very interesting. In low metallicity regime, we see enhanced uh, either iron or carbon nitrogen abundance ratio. What's going on? What I think uh, is going on is this is a direct signature of mixing, you know, with uh, outflowed uh, mature gas being mixed with infalling chemically pristine gas that will lower the overall metallicity but retain the abundance pattern where the enrichment came from. So um, we are building the sample now just to really, I think this is really to answer uh, the question in the break, that this is how we can really pin down the origin of the gas. That's my expectation, coupled with the kinematics. So this just an example three directly connect to galaxies. This is a clear disk galaxy with clear rotation curve, uh, you know, detected in, again, uh, integral field unit data. And at 80 kpc away, we see uh, three resolved components. Uh, while it roughly follow the co-rotation motion, you can see a large scatter. And again, imagine deep project along the line of sight, you can see uh, possibly that these came out of the, uh, you know, different parts, different radii along the line of sight. And you can see the, the, you know, the chemical abundance is very inhomogeneous. There's a large scatter you know, in terms of overall metallicity and uh, the pattern. And I want to, so one surprise out of this survey is really this, the detection of molecular hydrogen. Uh, so this is the laman warner band uh, that occurred in the UV. I think we saw the uh, electron diagram yesterday. This is coming out of the ground state to the uh, upper excited state. Um, and there's like hundreds of different lines, it took a while. Uh, so this is work by, done by Aaron Batcher, a postdoc at the time. Uh, through modeling all these different rotation, I mean, vibration uh, levels, uh, we can constrain the uh, H2 metallicity, uh, sorry, H2 calm density uh, to a really high uh, fraction. And what's most surprising really is because of the extensive galaxy survey data we have, there's no star forming galaxies around. Instead, we find one massive evolved galaxy at 40 kpc away from this molecular cloud. Uh, so there's one caveat with quasar absorption line study, that is there's the monster right in the middle. So a typical question is always, what if there is a dwarf galaxy hidden under the 
uh, PSF of the quasar. So what we can say is with this integral field uh, data, we can at least constrain based on the lack of emission lines uh, to be no more than 0.1 solar mass a year uh, kind of star formation rate. So this is second system we found, second H2 detection we found around an elliptical galaxy. Um, so going back, this is the last topic I want to cover really uh, to look at the turbulent uh, energy content. First, we just look at the ratio between turbulent energy and the total, um, you know, total kinetic energy. Uh, since we can decompose the line into thermal versus non-thermal, we can also convert the thermal energy uh, to total energy ratio to, uh, to uh, look at whether the gas uh, is moving. So number one, we can look at how much turbulent energy contributes to the uh, total kinetic energy. And number two, how fast is the turbulent energy moving? And this is just a uh, you know, quick um, ex explanation for how you can do that. Basically uh, for thermal energy is really, you, you just look at the, um, temperature of the gas versus the adiabatic index uh, for monotonic gas, this is five thirds. And then for turbulent energy, it's very straightforward. And coupled with the sound speed, uh, we expect based on uh, the temperature, you can work out that if we look at the thermal energy to total energy ratio, we can constrain the Mach number. And we looked at that for halos divided into star forming versus uh, quasars and halos. And it's really surprising to see that there's actually a distinction. Well, you can see this is the cumulative distribution as a function of thermal energy fraction. At the top, as I said earlier, we can convert this into the Mach number for the gas motion. So it turns out that for passive halos, it looks like there's a higher fraction of halos that had more dominant turbulent energy. Um, this is like, you can see there's about 30% of the gas that uh, has the uh, gas exceeding, uh, I mean, that falls in the supersonic regime. In contrast for star forming galaxies, this is less than 10%. So this is really uh, opposite of what I would expect. Uh, given the expectation that um, star forming galaxies are putting out a lot of energy like crazy and quiescent halos are uh, quiescent. So it goes back to the interpretation of the incidence of uh, metal absorbers, uh, whether there's this, uh, this is feedback or this is really a quenching mechanism that we are seeing. Um, so, so that's one thing that we found. So the next thing we looked at is directly just to look at the, again, so how the velocity and size relation uh, looked like for these cool clouds. So this is going back to this kind of turbulent energy cascade idea following uh, what started by Larson back in the 80s. Because as I said before, we have very detailed photoionization models and uh, that gives us density measurement. And through the density and known observed column density, we can infer the size. So, but again, the density is inferred based on ionic ratios that does not involve hydrogen. And it's only after the ionization model is constrained, then we'll go back and ask, what is the hydrogen ionization fraction and based on the observed H1 column density, we can infer the size here. And what we see is there's a range, there's a large range. The size goes from one parsec up to 10, 100, one megaparsec. Uh, so there's no models that are perfect. Um, so this is why I included a Jinx mass curve here to show that these two points cannot be trusted. 
Otherwise, we would expect the clouds to collapse. And the problem here is going back to what I mentioned earlier, one of the systematic uncertainties is due to ionization field. If there's any local, any contribution from local sources, we would expect enhanced uh, radiation field and that will increase the inferred gas density. And that will bring the points uh, back to a uh, smaller and higher density parameter space. There are hints that we can look for, it's not arbitrary. And uh, I would also say that some of these large clumps are also uh, worth a detailed look because we can also use 21 centimeter observations as a guide that in high velocity clouds, the typical size of high velocity clouds is about 100 parsecs. And we rarely see anything, probably never uh, bigger than one KPC. So all of these uh, could presumably mean that there's additional uh, contribution due to local fluctuation. So if you look at things under the one KPC, this is relatively um, random. And there's the minimum column density, total hydrogen column density that's set uh, by the cloud formation criterion. If you think about the cooling time at 10 to the four Kelvin and the uh, sound speed, certainly the sound crossing time set by the sound speed needs to be less than uh, the cooling time in order for the density to survive. And when we work that out, this is naturally, it came out right around here. So it's quite nice to see that. So once we look at this, uh, this is the velocity to size relation that uh, came out of the CGM study. So in the vertical axis here, I only show the non-thermal width. So the thermal condition has been removed. And uh, so between, so again, the two points uh, are excluded because the natural Jinx mass argument, uh, Jinx length argument. But if we just look at the one KPC, one parsec to one KPC range, the fitting came out to be very nicely uh, consistent with the expectation from Komogorov. This is equivalent to the first order uh, velocity structure function is looking at the velocity dispersion within internal, uh, the internal velocity dispersion within each clump. It goes with one third power. And we can infer the energy transfer rate to be uh, one one thousandth uh, from one KPC down to one parsec. So this is, uh, this is, about a hundred times lower than what we see in the ISM in star forming region in Orion Nebulae. Uh, and also hundred times lower than what we saw using the extended quasar nebulae at ratio of one that I mentioned earlier. But it's very consistent with what people see using multiple lens quasar side lines at ratio of three. So overall, it's really quiescent. It's quite quiescent. Uh, so um, still, I think this is another uh, piece of clue to tell us the origin of the cloud. Presumably, the turbulence was inherited from the hot halo, from where they came from. Uh, it's not much. It's not uh, highly turbulent at all. But if you work out the, uh, you know, the turbulent uh, dissipation time, it's of older, 100 million years. It's not very long either. So very quickly, nearly delta function, uh, the energy will be dissipated. So it does tell us that we need continue energy supply, even at this low level. So so there is still, you know. Um, something needs to be happening in order to support this kind of uh, um, turbulent energy that we see. So just to summarize, uh, this is the uh, last slide. Uh, there's a lot that we can learn from high resolution spectroscopy beyond just simple cross-section. 
but this is a very complicated, you know, multi-phase, multi-skill uh, question, and also covering a broad uh, mass range. So different techniques will tell us something. And most importantly, now we see through direct uh, absorption spectroscopy that there's large variation in density, velocity, and also abundance pattern in individual halos. It uh, really highlights the complexity in this baryon cycle, very much like uh, what we see in the ISM, uh, but just at the lower density. And um, so uh, I guess I will just end here. You can just read the bullet points. All right, some questions. Thank you for the lecture. Um, so some of the elements that you were showcasing, such as carbon and oxygen, are potential uh, elements that also are uh, used for the formation of molecules, such as CO, or are key elements for the formation of dust grains uh, or get accreted on the two dust grains so that it gets locked up and not visible in a gas phase, at least in the interstellar medium. What's happening with the molecules and the dust in the intergalactic medium? What's happening? Um, it's a mystery that they can survive <laughs> in the uh, halo environment. Um, I mean, I don't know the answer is. Um, we do see um, signatures of extinction in the halo but I don't know how to explain it. I guess this is why people are looking for CO, extended CO, um, but I don't know if they have an explanation. So as a follow-up, uh, you said that you're detecting molecular H2. Uh, in which fraction of the H1, for instance? Uh, it was about, it was about, I want to say 90% to, yes. How many, sorry? 90%. And and what is the temperature of the H2? Any any ways to know this? The temperature, the kinetic temperature? The temperature. Uh, hmm, I need to think about this. Uh, the kinetic temperature, um, I thought it was 100 degree Kelvin. I need to go back and check. It's warm. Oh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, I have two questions. The first question is like when I look at the um the spectrum velocity spectrum of like turbulent driven and thermal driven like um plot from Rudy twenty nineteen mm -hmm. as you have in the lecture, mm -hmm. it seems like a silicon four and carbon four lines agree really well on the turbulent line turbulent driven case, but there is a lot of fluctuations for like silicon four and carbon four. Like, what is the cause of this? Um, so it's real data. Uh, there's noise. Uh, I try very hard to find the nice examples, but uh, there are other features. So it's not a perfect example. But never mind. Uh, the main message is silicon is was narrower. That, that's what I want you to see. see. So if you're talking about small features, mm -hmm. I would attribute that to noise. Great. Uh, the second question is like, it seems like, I mean, there are a lot of elements available and like it is impossible to fit like for every single element perfectly for the model. Like, do you, is there any like common pattern that you notice when you try to fit for the model that some elements are not really like some elements at certain phase are not really well fit or, yes. come, or, or fit really well? Um, so um, we are lucky in a sense that because we designed the experiment, so we have the data we need, uh, but not often we have that kind of luxury. But typically, you know, this is an iterative process. What I would do is to find, to fit alpha elements first, but even within alpha elements, there are differentials. So if the best case scenario is to compare, say, 
oxygen ions first or carbon ions, just similar same elements first. If I don't have that luxury, I will just focus on alpha elements, but definitely not to combine iron or carbon or nitrogen. So that's how we found that nitrogen is always underabundant with a, a few exceptions. Carbon is always underabundant. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I just have a clarifying question about something you talked about at the beginning with the Lyman alpha and differentiating between inflow and outflow situations. So if I'm understanding correctly, you are able to differentiate between these because you see one component, either red shifted or blue shifted, as weaker because it's attenuated by... It, it's, uh, it's not attenuated. Uh, if I can do this, can I do this? Uh, it's really, um, if you have the intrinsic, can you see? No. You can't. <laughs> uh, what do I do? Uh, I but is the assumption that the, the weaker component is Actually, behind? let me see, let me see, let me see. Whoops. All right. So it's really, you know, this is the rest frame line that's in red. But if you if we just take infall as an example, if the gas is infalling, you know, if you are the particle, you see the photon coming toward you, right? So the resonant frequency will be shifted, uh, the resonant frequency will be shifted to the red. And your absorption is happening in the wings. And that's how you create a, a symmetry. Okay, I don't think I fully understand, but I might ask afterwards. Okay. Some other questions. The line is blue shifted. Because it's the particle that's doing the absorption. You are the particle, you are the hydrogen. And the photon comes to you. The peak is blue shifted. So you will only absorb at resonant frequency in the rest frame. And that happens in the red wing because the line is blue shifted. Now, what exactly happens to those clouds? Like um, if they are accreted back onto the galaxy, um, can we see this because they are um, like shock heated or anything? And um, in general, are there ideas how long those clouds survive in the halo? Right. So there are different processes uh, that will try to destroy the cloud, right? Once the cloud condenses out of the halo, the density is higher, it's going to fall in the gravitational field. So once you have the velocity shear, you would expect a lot of instabilities to set in. The first order is just the ramp pressure drag. So it's gonna not only uh, you know uh, slow the cloud down, uh, increasing the infall time, but it will also start stripping the material off bits by bits. So we can calculate. You know, it really depends on the density of the hot halo. The the numbers will change, but of order you know of order, of order magnitude we talk about dynamical time. So it depends on the uh, cloud destruction, how uh, effective it is. You know, we're talking about 100 million year time scale. The dilution uh, argument, that dilution argument you mentioned. So the, I, I think I, I totally agree. The, the signature, chemical signature, you, you saw high ion to alpha. 
in a stellar community, they are low alpha population, it's called. So it's a clear signature of dilution if you plot in that panel. My question is how frequent do you see, or what's the, what mass of galaxies, do you have any mass of galaxies, any environmental effect? Do you know any such information? So not yet, but hopefully soon. So the initial iron to magnesium abundance that I show, enhanced iron to magnesium, that was just based on the iron alone. We don't have hydrogen information for those halos, unfortunately. We're not just building the sample. That was the second plot I showed. And those are for star forming galaxies. And uh, the metallurgy is low, but then the iron abundance is as solar. Um, so that's, that's all we have for now, but hopefully um, the sample will be increasing in the next year or so. Then we, I can tell you more. Hey, um, great talk. So I have perhaps a very naive question. And I was just wondering why um, are the damped lemon alpha systems usually only observed in quasar systems? Like, perhaps you could comment on that. Why? In quasar yeah. systems, you mean what? I think I think um, I've only heard the term like damped lemon alpha systems or lines, but they're only usually associated with like quasar systems or quasars? Uh, no, so th they are primarily identified along quasar side lines, uh, okay. but they are at cosmologically distinct redshift. There are some damped alpha found close to quasar redshift. Those are called proximate DLAs. And those are, um, you know, either shielded from the, you know, you know due to quasar outflow shielded uh, by the dense gas, or they are in the you know large scale correlated halos that are not really directly related to the quasars, um, but most DLAs are found at low redshift, cosmologically distinct from the quasar host halo. And is that because of the mechanisms of how they were <clears throat> produced, like due to radiation dampening and stuff like that? It's likely because we hit a galaxy in the middle. So basically, if you put the Milky Way somewhere along the line of sight, if there's a quasar shining through, you will see a DLA. I see. Okay. Yeah. But that example I showed is instead of a, a well-formed disk, it's most likely streams like Magellanic streams in the local universe. If you But the cross-section is much smaller, right? It's really hard to hit a stream, but then in that case, that's that's what happened. Okay. Makes sense. Cool. Thanks. So in the absorption system near the, I think it was an electrical galaxy where you have H2 detections in uh -huh. absorption. Maybe I didn't catch it, but like, was the H2 column density high? And if it was high, did you look for electronic CO absorption also in the UV? We look for CO, we didn't detect CO. Okay. And the H2 column density is 10 to the 19. Okay, so it's still pretty high. It's high. The H2 fraction is high. Yes. Thank you. Uh, seeing as you skipped over, I'm curious, what constraints do we have on either the CG, the uh, circumgalactic or intergalactic radiation field that could help you sort of try and remove those degeneracies? So at, in the nearby universe is easier, but still very hard. What people have tried is to just model the H alpha filament. So you look at the H alpha strength and you want you infer the ionization fraction. It's very much the photoionization equilibrium. So in the local universe, they found more or less consistent with the big error bars though. Um, with the uh, ambient background, like the hard metal or other people. At high ratio, what we are looking for is odd abundance pattern of different ions. The one thing I skipped was the odd helium abundance. There we see helium is a light element. So there's no question about helium to hydrogen ratio. And yet in that system, we saw very few helium one around. So that's a very clear, uh, you know, clue that there's additional ionizing source around. 
how much uh, really depends on the shape. That's unfortunate. So, but that that's one uh, case we can say more confidently what the radiation field needs to be. So I think we have enough time for another question or so. Any, oh, there's one, all right. So as uh, you show the diagram, uh, temperature versus density with various uh, ionized states. And uh, I didn't quite catch what the error bars were on the first instance of this diagram. And I was wondering whether we could do the same in our own ISM, having some tracers of the In the measurement of the model? In the, the, this was in the first part of your talk. Of the talk? Yeah. A big phase diagram with lots of, uh, mm -hmm. it looked like, like tracers. Well, you're going the wrong way, I guess. I'm going forward. forward. Oh, you're going forward. Okay, great. This, this, this is not error bar. This is the range. Uh, if you couple that with the ionization equilibrium, you know, within the temperature, that's the range that we expect to see the ion. Uh, and uh, the density as well. This is theoretical model. But observation, we can do much better. We can measure the temperature to 0.1 dec. Density, the Statistical error is small. It's more of about systematics because changing the radiation field can change the density by a factor of a few. Does that answer your question? Ah, um, I will be back to the ISAM expert. All right, well, I think that was a very uh, thorough round of questioning. So let's thank our speaker again.